right, good morning. This is our 88th Coffee with the Commissioner uh, live stream. We're doing it on Facebook, and uh, we got a lot to talk about, but we're very, very excited today. We have a very special guest this morning. We have Allison Hill, who's the CEO of LifeView Group. Uh, good morning, Allison. Thanks for getting up early and being here. Good morning. Thanks for having me this morning. Absolutely. And then we have our regulars, our uh, Coffee with the Commissioner regulars. We've got our County Administrator, Wes Marinos, here. Good morning, Wes. Good morning, Commissioner. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for getting up early. And then, of course, we have Eric Gilmore, who's going to bring us a complete, comprehensive update on all things public safety. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Commissioner. Thank you very, thank you very much for being here. Well, there's a lot going on, and and Allison, I got to tell you, this, this is kind of funny. Normally, when I set up for these shows, I, I do like a one pager, right? But today, since we're talking about what you guys do, I've actually got two pages worth of questions. So, uh, hopefully, well, I hope I have two pages oh, of answers for you, Commissioner. <laughs> hopefully, you've got all the answers for me. But uh, right. I'm looking forward to it. And again, thanks for being here. So, normally we kick these off, and, and Wes will give us an update on what's going on in the county. We have a meeting tomorrow. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on. So, Wes, um, what do we got going on in the county right now? Well, today we're cutting a ribbon on the new multi-purpose building out of Rosenham. It's a big That's deal. Right. Uh, Michael Rhodes and facilities did a fantastic job of bringing that facility online. Uh, we're coming into the SEC women's soccer tournament. It's a big deal. The SEC has been in town. They've looked at it. They've been inside it. They love it. And uh, so we have a, we're forming a good relationship there. Michael Rhodes is just, and his bunch are just knocking it out of the park there. Oh, yeah. In, in, in our parks department. And then, you know, on the, on the agenda tomorrow, we have three, four, maybe five houses that we're awarding for new construction for affordable housing. And they're scattered throughout mainly district three, but that's a, an initiative that we brought forward. And by the end of, shortly after the first year, we'll have 14 or 15 houses that we've constructed that we're gonna work with a nonprofit and uh, put, some, put some families in those houses. That's a good thing. And then we just have a lot of work going on. We have a lot of work still driving out of engineering and uh, we have some items on the agenda tomorrow for that. The departments are doing really well. Uh, I will make an announcement. I, I know I called you the other day. Uh, our HR director, Crystal, has uh, decided to uh, resign, and her and her family are going to move to San Antonio. They've take, taken advantage of an opportunity out there. So Nikki Powell, anybody's been with the county any amount of time, they know Nikki Powell. She's going to move down to HR as an interim director. And I think it'll be a very smooth transition. She's uh, no. Hey, Wes, can I ask you something? Is is Nikki Powell going to be the interim, or are we going to bring her up and make we'll, her the? We'll, we'll go interim. We'll let her fly interim for a while and see how she likes it. See how things go. All right. And then we'll make a decision from there. But I, I think it's going to be a smooth transition. She's very familiar with our organization. The directors know her. They love her. And yeah, uh, yeah. I think the board's really familiar with her. Everyone has, has a good relationship with her. So I can I ask you something good. else too? Mm -hmm. Because I know you're very fond of Crystal, as we all are. She's a rock star. It's it's what a you did you try and talk her out of it? <laughs> well, yeah, I did. Uh, they got a, they got a close knit group of friends there in San Antonio, and that's uh, I think her husband is taking a, a job there, and I think that's just kind of where they're they're looking to go. But I'm gonna I'm I do hate to lose her. Uh, she she stepped in really in a tough time in HR, and she and I both took on some things and. And she battled through them, and she, she's made some great changes, made some great relationships throughout the county. And so I appreciate everything that she's done for me and for the county Yeah, in their two years that she's been here. Well, that's, a, that's a huge loss. You know, it's, it's tough when anyone leaves, but when someone who's just, you know, she's and she's always so pleasant with a smile on her face and mm -hmm. willing to help. I've called her. She always picks up the phone. I mean, it's a loss. Uh, she, whoever's going to fill that position, that, that's big, big shoes to fill. So we'll miss her, and we thank her for everything she did for the county. Yeah. Absolutely. She's... She lights up the room. She comes in. There's no doubt about it. She's always positive. You know, I like positive. That's what I look for when I try to hire, especially directors. I want somebody who's positive. I want somebody who smiles. I want somebody who's optimistic. I want yes. somebody who's driven. I mean, not negativity. You know, negativity is never going to be successful. Nope. But she was the epitome of those characteristics and yeah. still is. But we'll miss her. And But we'll, we'll be okay. We'll move on. Nikki will go down there. And Nikki's just as, just as driven and just as positive and optimistic, too. I think we'll be fine there. But other than that, the departments are running very well. Uh, the public works is doing what they do. Development services still processing a, a lot of, you know, pre-apps and applications and, and those sorts of things. And uh, I'm not going to touch on public safety. Eric's got some good news coming out of public safety. I'll let him handle that. Fantastic. But, uh, uh, yeah, it's a lot of excitement. I think morale is great throughout the county right now. We have a few spots. I mean, an organization this big, you're always going to have a few spots. Absolutely. But, yeah, uh, and it's a big, a big organization, lots of moving parts. 
yeah. you can't make everyone happy. You got a tough job. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> Thank you for doing well, it. The, the other announcement is not really county business, but you know we competed in the state cookoff Friday night, and oh and yeah, our t- third place out of 20 teams. Congr- hey, congratulations! I tell you what, I made two passes at that at the fire. Uh, at the ECFR uh, stake, uh, well, I, but in full fairness, I went. I made two passes at all the the stake. <laughs> I put a lot of dollars in a lot of things. So, uh, and yeah. Wes, that was really cool that you stepped up. Now, my understanding in talking to um, Commissioner Bender was you were like a, a last minute sub, and they said, "Hey, you know, we need you here." What happened with that? Yeah, about a day and a half, two days before, he says, "Hey, everybody's got other things. I need some help." Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come help you. You know, I, we didn't have any pre planning. We didn't have a plan. We didn't do any practicing. We just showed up. Wow. And uh, we we did well. We did well together. Yeah, it was a great event. I'll tell you what, you, you know, the cholesterol goes way up after that one because you're eating red meat <laughs> one after another. <laughs> hey, people came through the line five and six times. They kept coming back. I don't know where they're putting all this stuff yet. Well, you know, the, the, the issue is, Wes, see, you're the victim of your own ability. I still remember three years ago, you made like a turkey breast concoction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, turkey breast is notoriously dry if you don't do it just right. I still, to this day, don't know what you did, but that was the most tender, juicy uh, turkey breast I've ever eaten in my life, man. What what was the secret? What was the secret? Butter? Butter, butter. butter. Everyone uses butter, though. (laughs) What is it, magic butter? (laughs) You know, I I get those turkey breasts from Kevin Green over the butcher shop, and they're just large, standalone turkey breasts, and you peel the skin off of them. Uh, Coat them with mayonnaise and put a, a, a beef rub on them and put them on the big, big green egg and base them with butter about every 30 minutes. I mean, that was incredible. I hope that you'll do it again this holiday season because that was yeah, really- They're already ordered. Now, hey, fi- final thing. I know tomorrow we got a meeting and it, it, you know, going through the agenda, it looks fairly routine, but mm-hmm. uh, there is one issue. And I, I appreciate you taking time yesterday to kind of, you know, explain the whole situation. But um, it looks like we are going to be requesting a... Um, due diligence and some appraisals for a uh, for a, a motel and uh explain explain what we're what we're trying to do on that i i think it's kind of a nifty idea so the theory is uh, it's a, to create affordable rentals and so they're looking we're going to ask do our due diligence to get our appraisals done assess the building the condition of the building and if we move forward with it the the, the thought is to get some of those folks that are currently housed in shelters that are working, they have jobs, they have income, uh, they're trying to get back on their feet, they've been participating in supportive services, uh, trying to get get things back right, and so to bring those folks and let them rent some of these units out of this hotel, clear the shelters out for to put more folks in and maybe get more folks wrapped around support services, but it's kind of like a transitional thing it's not a place where you're going to rent forever, but the, the whole point of supportive services is to get is to get them up and going and be able to get, uh, take care of themselves, uh, you know, with with affordable housing. So it's something we're looking at. We'll see how it goes. Uh, again, I, I was thinking about this morning. That I guess I get the the affordable housing or the affordable rental part, but my concern always goes back to okay, who's going to maintain this building? What else is going to be wrong with this building? How much is this going to cost us if, if we were to buy this building? So there's still a lot of questions. This is just step one in, in, our, in, our, in our due diligence. Yeah, well, I, and I appreciate that. And, you know, the thing that um, the thing that uh, that you guys mentioned, Liz and you yesterday in our meeting was, that's kind of a telling statistic is that 50% of the folks um, in our homeless shelters, you know, you can think of the numerous shelters that we have. Fifty percent of them are actually folks that live here and work here. They're just they're 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 just not making enough to pay the rent and all the other things. So, if we are able to transition some of those folks who are actually working and receiving supportive services over to a, a, a brick and mortar facility, you know, run by a nonprofit, my understanding we're going to put it out mm-hmm. as an RFP and and find a, a nonprofit to run it. Um, but if we can move that fifty percent of working poor, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, into that facility and, and help, you know, help them along, then that opens up a 50% capacity for the, the folks that are, 
you know, living in tents in the woods or, you know, on the side of the street uh, where we see. So I kind of like that idea. It's a cascade effect and you kind of start to solve two problems with one thing. Now, the only question that I have like you is who's going to maintain it. And then what we've seen with, with the lodges and the Maxwell site is they burn through cash quick and, you know, it, it, it has to be something that's sustainable. So how do we, how do we make that a, a model that's sustainable, Wes, without them coming back to the county and the city? Well, that's going to be part of the RFP proposal is how are you going to be sustainable? Yeah. We can't keep throwing good money after, after good money, you know, to, to sustain some of these places. So part of the RP process is you're going to have to lay out your plan to tell us number one, not just what your supportive services are, but how, what is your plan to be self-sustainable yeah. without having come continuously come to the city or the county, you know, I need 250, I need 250, I need 350. It, right. it, it gets cumbersome. So that's going to be part of the proposal process. Okay. It's going to well, lay it out as to how they're going to do it. Well, I, I look forward to that discussion. That's that's going to be good. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where my counterparts stand on that on that issue because I'm getting a lot of I have a lot of constituents who are very very concerned about you know some of the some of the things that we see and I I can't wait to to speak with Allison about some of those things because I think a lot of them go back to mental health undiagnosed undi untreated and it it leads to a lot of our societal issues that we have. Um, uh, Wes, I appreciate that 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 uh, update. Thank you. And Eric, uh, what's going on in public safety? Well, first off, how about this weather? I mean, I come love on. it. Oh, oh. 61 degrees. Oh, the only fantastic. way it could be better is if we had low humidity like they got in Arizona and we don't have that damp chill. But anyway, uh, it's been great. So I want to remind everybody we still have 43 days left of hurricane season, even though we're getting cooler. Uh, we're winding down. Uh, we are out of our peak season, which is good, but we still got a couple of lows out there that's going to go to the Atlantic. But uh, overall, public safety. We're rocking along. Uh, we're, we're getting out there. We're running the calls. A lot of good things have been happening. Uh, recently on October the 7th, uh, ECFR made a, uh, a grab out of one of our residential structure fires. Uh, we'll be doing a press conference about that this Friday uh, to talk about, you know, the the, the diligence the crews put together, uh, did to make that, make that save. But we're also tying it to October is Fire Prevention Month. Uh, making sure that you have your plan together for your family. Make sure that you know where your uh, muster points are. Make sure your batteries are checked, you, that you have a smoke detector. We're going to talk about our smoke detector program. You can call uh, the office here at Escambia County of Public Safety, and we'll come install a smoke detector if you don't have one. Uh, so make sure you get those uh, safety uh, the safety measures put in place in your house so you can protect your family. So, uh, But uh, uh, the lifeguards, uh, of course, we pulled the towers off the beaches, so they're done, but they'll be monitoring. So lifeguards are still at the beaches, just not in full force like they were. And we always wind down after, you know, right before uh, uh, Labor Day anyway, because our staffing, our, our, our high school students and college students. So, uh, but we'll be having tryouts in December. So if you're interested in becoming a lifeguard, and we start at 18, 21 an hour, I do believe. Uh, for the summer, uh, we do have two rounds of tryouts in December, and we do that during the Christmas holidays. So when those college students come back home or, you know, those uh, students are out of school for the holidays, they can go take their uh, test. It's, it'll be done at the uh, UWF Aquatic Center, and we've got the information on our website. Go to myscambia.com, public safety, lifeguards, and you can see the information there. So if you're interested in becoming a lifeguard. Eric, is there a, is, do you have to be 18? Could you be like 17 or do you have to be 18 to do it? We have 16 year olds. Okay. So that's what I thought. And up. No, sir. Okay. We have 16, 16 and up. And, and, you know, when we get those 16 year olds in and you, you know, you, you don't know they're 16 because they, they, they do a good job and Dave uh, Greenwood and uh, Alexander Johnson and Jake Wilson, those leader, that leadership, they do a good job of getting those guys uh, how to interact with the public how to present themselves. They do a, do it in a professional manner. So you really don't know those guys are 16. So, or, or if they are 16 or 18, but they do a phenomenal job. And when they always pick good uh, people, to, uh, good representation of the county out there that has, you know, you come down from Minnesota and we got red uh, red flags flying that day. And now you want to, you come all the way down here, you want to get in the water. And that 16 year old got to go out there and say, I'm sorry, you can't get in the water. And they do right. a very good job of explaining why and not just, you know, not just telling them you can't do it because I said so. So uh, they do a good job training those guys up to interact with the public. And, you know, at such a young age, it, that's that's hard for young people to, to have that interaction. So uh, they'd rather just send you a text saying don't go in the water. But anyway. So. <laughs> that's right. It's all about text messaging. <laughs> right. See? So, uh, hey, so how, how about staffing in uh, in EMS? I, you know, it's constantly a challenge. I know we had to... We, 
So how are we doing on, on staffing over there? So we are actually doing good in staffing on EMS. Uh, I think we have like two paramedic open positions right now, not including, not including the four paramedic positions that the board approved this last budget cycle. So we're hiring for those four additional paramedics. There's two paramedics. We, they did interviews last week. We had several come through that we're offering positions to. It takes a while to onboard them, as you can imagine, because they've got to go through orientation and all that. So it takes about a month, month and a half to get them on the road. Uh, to be trained up to what our protocols are, how we do things and stuff like that. But uh, uh, the EMTs, we're full on EMTs, uh, but we do have those additional four EMTs as well. So we'll be hiring for uh, those four EMTs. We do have some relief people that want to go full time. So that'll right. shorten that transition up a lot quicker. Uh, but no, our staffing levels are actually good on EMS. It's just, as we talked about before, we're trying to build our staffing levels up, not just fill the billet, but uh, these are four additional paramedics and four additional EMTs that we're adding to what we currently have now in our billet. So if we need to increase those staffing levels, not just fill the billet, to be successful and not holding calls and getting out there and, and reducing the alpha level. Uh, I got a toothache. I, yes. I don't feel good. I've been vomiting for two days. So we're doing a big campaign. We met with Casey Lagarde uh, this week, uh, Davis Wood, and we'll be putting this out of when to call for an ambulance, when to go to an urgent care, when to go to your primary care physician, uh, you know, call a pharmacist if you need to get a script filled or you need to get questions about a script. So we're, we're putting a program together for that because we do run an absorbent amount of frivolous calls is what I want to say, uh, not uh, an abuse of the 911 system. So that keeps us yeah. really busy with those low acuity calls. Yeah. Um, one, one, fi one final question on that. I, I uh, was actually invited to speak at an HOA um, out in Perdido Key, it was Grand Caribbean, Grand Caribbean, um, and you know they we went through a litany of different issues. But the one thing they said about public safety, and they really um, wanted me to emphasize this. So, um, is there what is our staffing model during the season? They they feel like we need to have an ambulance out at Perdido Key, a dedicated stationed ambulance there uh, in that fire station because of the the tourists and and the folks out there. They said they had to wait. Is, is that something that we already? I thought we already did that though. No, we don't do that. Uh, okay. You know, Pretty to Key, Pensacola Beach, those are our outliers. And mm -hmm. the, uh, the majority of our calls, 65-70% mm -hmm. of our calls are what we call in the core, which is right here off 29. From, sure. You know, city down through here. And trying to stage something out there is kind of hard because we are a status system, which means by the time the ambulance runs the call, deals with the patient, goes to the hospital, drops the patient off, they're going on their next run. It's, right. it's few and far between that they're sitting at a station or waiting on a call. Uh, we're a very busy ambulance system. So if we get the increased staffing numbers up, uh, not just fill the billet, but add to our staffing levels, then those things can start taking place where we can start strategically placing and staging ambulances out in those areas and wait on the calls. But don't we already stage one at Pensacola Beach, though? No. No, I thought we did. No, sir. Right. Now, now, we did during Hurricane Sally okay. that was because of the bridge issue. Uh -huh. uh, so that was done during that time frame. But since uh, when the bridge came back up, the three mile bridge, uh, the ambulance went away from uh, Pensacola Beach. So uh, the ambulance runs to Pensacola Beach as it would be pretty to key as needed on an as needed basis. So, OK, that's a good answer. Good answer. Well, Eric, I appreciate the update and uh, thanks for everything you do. And again, thank you for sending the report. Um, you know, Eric Gilmore s sends a report to the board. It's it's full of detailed information about every call run by the by the fire service whether it's structure fire, auto fire, um, sick call. Uh, it's really a, a great report, and, and I appreciate it. Uh, I hope that my counterparts do too. Uh, who all gets that? Is it just the board, or do you send that out to yeah, the so media? It well? goes to the board. It goes to uh, Wes. It goes to Debbie Bowers. It goes okay. to Allison uh, Rogers, and it goes to Davis Wood. So and oh, then we so start currently here. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Well, good. I appreciate you doing that. All right, Allison, thank you for your patience. Thank you for getting up early. Um, Allison mm -hmm. Hill is here. from. She's the CEO of Life U Group, and uh, – Lots of good news uh, with with you and your organization. I had the opportunity to meet with you and and one of your um, one of your top leaders uh, at Starbucks, and we talked a lot about mental health and we talked about some of the challenges in Escambia County. So I want to first um, ask you to tell us about what you do at Life You Group. What does Life You uh, Group do, and is it the same as when you were with Lakeview? Thank you, Commissioner. That's a great question, and it's hard to believe it's been two years. Uh, yeah. that Life View Group has been around. We just celebrated that milestone, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, but Life View Group is actually uh, the nonprofit organization that when um, Life View uh, separated from the healthcare system here in town, Life View Group became the new parent company. So under our area of, of operations, uh, 
Lakeview Center, which is the Community Mental Health Center serving uh, Escambia, Santa Rosa, uh, Walton County. Uh, we Families First Network is the foster care program where we do case management and adoption services for the state of Florida. And the Global Connections to Employment, where we employ individuals with significant disabilities. We actually uh, contract, we're a federal defense contractor with um, Department of Defense. We're on military installation in, in 15 states in the District of Columbia. Uh, employing 75% of the labor is performed by an individual with a significant disability. So a large social service organization, about 2,400 team members headquartered here in Pensacola. We've been around for a very, very long time, um, celebrating 70 years uh, next year. But again, with the reorganization and the changes in how we're structured, uh, learning to tell our story a little bit differently and, and connect all those different operations yeah, it, um, it, it, I was I was astonished when when we were talking uh, and you were telling me just how large your organization is and how big. I mean, did you say fifteen states? Fifteen states. Wow, and twenty four hundred employees. Yes, that's incredible. Wow, yes. that's a big organization. Now, a lot of folks have asked why did why was it necessary to separate from Baptist? Because it seems like you all had a what is there a canned uh, answer for that? Or <laughs> I'm sure there's an <laughs> well, idea. there's an answer that I use. <laughs> I don't know if it's canned or not. <laughs> but um, when we affiliated with Baptist in the mid '90s, we mm -hmm. primarily were focused on behavioral health. And there was a lot of synergy being part of a, an acute care system. And it made a lot of sense. You know, fast forward two and a half decades, and we had changed as an organization. The healthcare system had changed. And we just realized we didn't have the same synergies that we did. Um, our payers are very different. Our customer expectations are very different. The way we recruit team members, the geography we cover. And so it was a very, you know, collegial process. The Baptist was dedicated to making sure that services stayed in the community. Um, but we just needed to run business differently and make different decisions. Uh, they need to focus on the on the new hospital opening. And so it was um, a very relatively smooth. I mean, uh, big organizations separating is as smooth as you can expect, but but it's been a good a good process, and there's still good partnership and collaboration. So, so in other words, it wasn't like what we see in Succession, the show. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Wes isn't smiling. That means he hasn't watched it. It's a phenomenal <laughs> show. Anyway, uh, well, I'm glad to hear that. Now, uh, now, a lot of people ask. Okay, so um, what exactly in this community does Life View do? So, in this community. Um, specifically like in Escambia County, where you will see our operations. Most people are very familiar with Lakeview Center. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, you know, that's the name we did business under, but Lakeview Center is still around. Lakeview Center hasn't gone away. I think what has changed is that the name Lakeview Center represented our behavioral health services, but they also had all those other operations tucked up underneath it. So now we've separated that out. So there's a little more clarity. So in Escambia County, under Lakeview Center, we are providing a substance abuse and mental health services across the full continuum of care. So you have outpatient counseling. Uh, we employ about 25 psychiatrists and, and uh, mid-level APRNs, um, PA, wow. providing um, psychiatric care. We have day programs and case management, residential, inpatient uh, we serve adults and children. Last year, we served about 25,000 individuals in this community. Just in Escambia County? Uh, uh, across. So we are the primary uh, community mental health center for Escambia, Santa Rosa, and Walton counties. Okay. We have some operations in Okaloosa County as well. Interesting. But, but by far, Escambia, is just population, is the largest. But in total, we serve almost 25,000 people. One of the things we talked about when we met um, was the central receiving facility. Michelle Salzman, state rep, it was a, a ball of energy, a ball of fire, has been working really hard with the task force. And then, of course, the county engaged. I know that we have, uh, you know, we, we have partners. I believe Santa Rosa is assisting um, the city of Pensacola. So the central receiving facility. Now, you're a miracle worker because first I heard was it was supposed to be like a million dollars recurring and you got that down to a little, uh, what, a little over three hundred thousand. How, number one, how how were you able to to get that reduced? I'm very thankful that you did, but how are you able to do that? And, and tell us about the progress on the central receiving facility. Sure. Well, if I, let me start with with what central receiving is, and then I will talk about the funding. I've never been called a miracle worker. I'm going to write that down. Um, please, not, please sure, do. that's totally accurate. It's just 
it's just the hustle that all of us do all the time. But um, central receiving facility is a concept that we started talking about uh, almost it's, it's been over a year ago, mm. and it, it was prompted by just events in the community, uh, what the hospitals were experiencing in emergency departments with individuals showing up with behavioral health issues, uh, mental health, or even substance abuse. Um, and, and we just, as a community came together and said, we got to do something better. And so we started benchmarking across the state, and in Florida, there are uh, it's been around for several years. This We wouldn't be the first. We certainly aren't the last. They're still growing across the state. But the concept of a central receiving system. Mm -hmm. And what that means is in Florida, if you are put under the Baker Act, which is involuntary commitment for assessment and evaluation, uh, you are taken to what's called a designated receiving facility. And currently in our community, those two facilities are Baptist Hospital and Florida West. Yes. Under a central receiving system, there is a central point of access where all Baker Acts are received. The triage, the assessment, the evaluation is performed. If you can divert to community services like those that Lakeview offers, then that, then that happens. If inpatient admission is the most appropriate level of care, then referrals are made to the two hospitals in town that have inpatient psychiatric services, so Baptist and Florida West. And so that's the concept that as a community uh, with the task, mental health task force, Rep Salzman's um, task force started looking at, we benchmarked across the state to say what works in other communities and would that work in our community? Does it need to look different? And um, so we do have a slightly different design than what you might would see in other communities. For instance, uh, Lakeview will be the central receiving point for all adults. Baptist Hospital will be the central receiving points for children and adolescents. Oh, really? Okay. Right. They have the only inpatient child adolescent beds from here to Panama City. So in order to, to manage the the trauma of that process. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want our, our young folks to come into a central place to be screened and then have to go to another place if they were going sure. to be admitted. So it uh, just made a lot more sense to have one, one location for that. And so our model that will serve Escambia and Santa Rosa County uh, looks a little bit different, but I think it's very appropriate for what our community needs are. So let me ask you this, just so people know. So if if a if a kid at, at say a middle school in our community just loses it and just goes, bonk, you know, just loses his mind, I'll just put it that way to be politically correct, uh, and they decide, hey, he he, this young man needs to be Baker acted. They're going to take him to Baptist. They're not going to take him to Florida West because I know at one point Florida West was uh, taking some of those patients, weren't they? Um, under the transportation plan that helps law enforcement know where Baker Acts go. Mm -hmm. um, the two receiving facilities, it's it's the closest receiving facility is, is how that transportation works. So it is possible that some adolescents ended up at Florida West. And again, that's a little bit what prompted this conversation is sure. um, having the right resources to provide care. And since they don't have child and adolescent facilities, um, you know, they were a little concerned about how do we how do we make sure people are getting to the right place? Right. And so with this conversation and with input from lots and lots of stakeholders, um, you know, there's a lot of people involved in this process. Oh, yeah. And so it, it was several months of planning um, and and looking again, benchmarking best practice and trying to figure out what is best for our community and to design services most appropriate. So so right now we are we're up and running, I'm assuming. Yes. So we are not up and running. Uh -oh. um, so one of the very first important steps is to secure funding. It is a brand new service and it is a very uh, you know, high level of care. So uh, the staff will be onboarding 50 to 75 new team members. We have started already. We are onboarding uh, physicians, nurses, you know, again, high skilled staff. And yes, we had to renovate some of our spaces to make sure that we could safely provide this care. So okay. all of those processes are underway. And we are working now through obviously the staffing, the licensing, uh, Department of Children and Families and Agency for Healthcare Administration are both involved in the licensing process. Oh, so yeah. that takes a little bit of time. Sure. So yeah. Do you have an estimated uh, time where this thing is going to launch? 
So I would say definitely uh, in the next couple of months. Okay. Uh, we are actually looking, part of this process was looking at the full continuum of services that are available. So in addition to opening the central receiving facility, we are adding um, crisis stabilization beds. So a few more inpatient beds to the continuum. Uh, we are expanding our short-term residential program to add, I believe we're adding four or six new beds in that program. And then relocating our um, detox beds, our, our uh, inpatient detoxification program that we opened earlier this year, relocating that program. So it's it's a little bit like chess, not checkers, you know, where you've <laughs> got to move a few pieces at a time and, and make sure that it all happens um, as quickly as we can um, and as safely as we can. Do you, do you think once we're at uh, steady state and all the pieces are put together, do you think it will adequately address the need in our community or will we still be, a sh on honestly, will we still have a shortfall of beds for, you know, adolescent crisis state? I mean, for any, or do you think we'll be about where we need to be? So one of the things I can tell you is adding beds is never going to solve the problem. I sure. think that is, as, as many people's go to, we need to add facilities. I um, mean, certainly we need to make sure we have the right facilities. There's different levels of care and we need to make sure that we have all that appropriate. But, you know, the analogy that I that I like to use that, that many people um, can relate to and understand is, you know, uh, hospital or inpatient beds are, if you have a physical health, if you have um, a heart attack, and mm -hmm. you're going to the emergency room and you're being triaged and you need to have a procedure, you're in the hospital for, for your few days stay, but then you go home and you have to learn how to eat differently and exercise and your lifestyle changes. That happens with behavioral health as well, is that you may have periods of crisis where you need to be stabilized and may require hospitalization, but then you live in the community. And so having those supports to wrap around our families and our children is just as important as having beds. So I, there's, you know, I don't want to say that it's not appropriate and that we don't need facilities. Um, I just, I like folks to, to have the, the full perspective because care happens in a lot of different settings and we need to make sure that, that we cover all of that continuum as we're investing in resources. Okay. Uh, now, and I'm going to throw this question at you. It seems that a lot of the, the dysfunction in society that we see, like uh, social ills, like crime, um, opioid addiction, overdoses, um, even things like people that, that do dysfunctional things like beat their kids. I mean, we have like the record out of the state of Florida, we have the highest number per capita of like child abuse cases. You know, you hear that. And we have the highest number of opioid overdoses per capita. I mean, we've got all these social ills. Um, and it seems like the one common denominator is this, is this untreated, undiagnosed mental health. So, I mean, we spend money. Um, we do, you know, organizations like, like Lakeview and Lifeview, you know, we, uh, we, you know, we do the things we need to do, but, um, what can we do to expand access? Because it seems like there's a lot of folks that are not getting the treatment that they need. In our so, community. yeah, so that one's a little tricky to, um, Jeff, <laughs> we hear a lot about access. And, and I will tell you in our community, we have a lot of resources um, and we need to do a better job of making sure that people know what those resources are and that they engage. Um, because having the availability it still requires individuals to say, I want to do something different. Sure. Um, I think when we talk about the child abuse and the, and the reporting uh, and, the, and the incident rates, you know, one of the things, so one of our affiliates is responsible for the case management and the adoption services for, for the dependency system in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I know about that is we are also a high reporting community. Mm -hmm. We are very involved. We have people paying attention. And we call the hotline and we we intervene. You, know, you don't see that in some other communities across the state. They just provide care in their community very differently. Huh, so I didn't know those that. resources that we can wrap around and provide for families. I mean, you know, Wes talked uh, at the very beginning when, when you were talking about buying the hotel and how it, it, it would be kind of a continuum that, that individuals may be in a shelter now, but then we wrap around services and we help them get a job, but they don't yes. yet have the resources to live. So then we can find affordable rent. You know, people live their, their life like on that continuum in times of stress, um, things like maybe losing a job or the death of a loved one, those things create 
stress in their life and their responses to that stress, you know, lead them to maybe needing resources. Interesting. Interesting. I think that, um, you know, people are very resilient and that's something that we don't talk about a lot um, and support systems help with that resiliency. And so knowing how to build those protective factors, finding the, those caring people in your life to help you through those times is, is very important. Do you find, you know, you hear anecdotally that the people, obviously they know if they've, if they've gone through, you know, being Baker acted or gone through, um, you know, detoxification for drug addiction or things of this nature. Uh, what do you do for someone who is resistant? You, you know, you, 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 the people always say, Hey, pay attention to your friends, look after your buddies, you know, but if you know, someone's got a problem and they won't go see treatment, what's your recommendation based on your experience? How do you get someone the treatment? If, if, if they don't, I mean, you can bring the horse to water, you can't make them drink it, but how, is there anything you can do to compel someone other than the Baker Act? Um, well, and I would say even the Baker Act isn't always compelling. You know, mm -hmm. a Baker Act is that immediate need to keep right. somebody safe or keep them from harming another person. Mm -hmm. um, so even that is, is a challenge. I think that um, you got to be there for people, Jeff, and you got to be there when they're ready for you to be there. That's right. one of the things that always amazes me about our team is that we have lifelong relationships with, with our clients and, um, and sometimes they need us and then things are good and they don't need us. And then they come back and they need us again. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, that is hard to watch loved ones go through that experience. Um, but when, but forcing treatment on individuals that aren't ready is, is not going to be the outcome that I think everybody thinks it's going to be. So mm -hmm. making sure that, that people know your loved ones know that they are supported, that you're there to help them. Um, I would say for individuals who do have loved ones in their life, you know, they need to be educated. They need to find their own support system because it's hard to watch your loved ones struggle. Yes. Um, and so, you know, building your own support system is important as well. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, that the, like Lakeview, we're not giving up on folks. We believe in recovery. We believe in um, everybody being able to live, you know, a healthy life. And so um, we will be there for folks when they need us. And that support system, it works the same way. Oh, that's good. I, I want to ask you about deinstitutionalization. I know that was a big thing in the 60s and 70s, and they emptied out the mental health facilities. And a lot of folks say that that needs, needs to be rethought that, you know, the rest of society is picking up, talking about picking up the pieces, but, you know, and, and I, you know, when you, when you look at say homelessness and some of the folks that are camping in the woods, um, you live in kind of dysfunctionally, maybe addicted to drugs as well. Some of them um, are, are out of their mind crazy. I mean, I, are you allowed to say that anymore? I guess, I guess so. Because some of the things they do, and I, and I've had constituents tell me, um, are crazy, like exposing themselves to children, defecating in public, um, filling a shopping cart full of Walmart bags full of feces and then dumping them on their yard. Yeah, that was a real complaint I got in District 1. Um, that's crazy. So should we rethink deinstitutionalization and put more of the emphasis on the state and the federal government to take care of these citizens that they've let loose out in our communities? So we... Certainly some behaviors are are crazy. I we don't in our field, we don't call it that. Um, you know, there is a, a diagnosis. Okay. Um, when when people Oops. have no, that's okay. It's just it's education, you know, unless you um have loved ones and have experiences with this, you you don't know what you don't know. Um, but diseases below the neck, people are a lot more tolerant of the diseases that affect above the neck are a little um, more un unnerving and, mm. and individuals don't always know how to how to respond. Mm. So when you know mental illness is not an excuse for breaking the law. Um, we don't we don't say that that's okay. If people have have done things that are not safe, that are illegal, you know, there's consequences of that. Your mental illness isn't an excuse. Sure. Um, but Everybody, so our philosophy and, and, and a community mental health philosophy is everybody should live as independently as, as they can and live the way that they want to live um, as long as they are safe and as long as the community is safe. And so we have 
we have a lot of different services for some of our, our more persistent, persistently mentally ill individuals where we can wrap around them and make sure that they're on medication, that they're engaging um, with their caseworkers, that they have food, that they're paying their bills, that, they're, that their hygiene is good. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of individuals without a mental illness that live in, in odd and unusual ways. Mm, and so yeah. um, it's it's not, you can't always just write it off to saying they, they must be crazy um, mm, because mm. people are unique, are unique individuals. And so. Yeah. I, and I guess, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to broad brush it, but I mean, you know, there are, there are individuals, uh, I'll give a, just a quick just a quick analogy or a quick uh, anecdotal story. I owned a business in Southern California and there was a, there was a community homeless guy um, that would go around and he would sit in the back of the businesses. He would take off his clothes down to his underwear and start, he would scream at cars going by. Uh, he would walk up and down the street and I would call the La Mesa police department. And they're like, well, there's nothing we can do about him, you know, but, but I mean, he was, it, he would intimidate people. He was a big guy, but out of his mind. I mean, talking to himself, yelling at cars, yelling at the air. I mean, I, okay. He had problems. I guess I, I'm going to try and be politically correct. I won't say that this guy was crazy. Um, everyone well, else, in that individual, likely Jeff, he may have had a, a, a diagnosis and a, and a, probably a, a pretty significant one. And he may not have been compliant with his medication, which is when the behaviors aren't, aren't managed. Well, but but yeah. but I guess the, the the point is so no one would do anything about it. The police wouldn't do anything about it. Um, you know the business owners you know would have to clean up after the guy, and I, I would always dread it when I'd pull up to the business and he'd be out there and I'm like oh boy he's going to hurt. So it, that's the kind of thing I think you know where the federal government or the state there should be a place for those folks that are really truly, um, and that's what that's what deinstitutionalized uh, deinstitutionalization those folks were put out and now there's a new crop of those folks. Uh, and maybe they don't seek services, but they are, you know, how do you put, they're a burden on the community and the business community and the residential. We see some of that in Escambia County. You know, I have constituents, I mean, you know, that are, okay. So how do we, how do we deal with that humanely, but efficiently and fairly for the people that live here and, and live a normal life? So what would generally happen is, is, you know, in this community, Lakeview is likely familiar with those individuals because again, it's kind of on a cycle. When a person is compliant with their medication, they may feel like maybe they don't need their medication. Yeah, um, yeah. And so then you kind of get in that cycle. But when we can interact with them, when we can intervene, you know, we have a mobile response team. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have a team that is working with our, our homeless camps okay. and they're rounding every day. They're visiting camps and, and trying to engage oh, individuals. Okay. When you when you live in survival mode, you know, the people that you trust, it's a small circle of people because that's how you survive. Sure. So it takes a little bit of time for to, to build that trust. You don't just walk up to individuals like the individual you described and say, hey, you know, let me help you right. because you don't have a relationship with that person. Sure. And so you build that relationship. You build that trust. You help them with some of their basic sure. needs like food and clothes and shelter. Um, and then hopefully work into a place where they trust you and they um, will will come with you to to see your doctor or get back on your medication, work with you. You know, we're doing a lot of um, long acting injectables now when we visit some of our, our homeless clients so that they don't have to worry about their medication being stolen or, um, or remembering to take it. And so we're trying different things to help individuals stabilize because again, once they are stabilized, then they start thinking about things like work, uh, affordable housing, you know, those kinds of things that that get them out of that that situation. But right. it's not again, just like diseases below the neck aren't cured. Right. Um, it's a lifelong disease. And so you will have those times where where everything is great. And then you'll have those times of stress and you need a little more support. Right. Well, I know it's it's a vexing issue, and it just seems that, it, that a lot of these issues, are, if you go back to the root cause, I think I mean, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I mean, you see a lot of these issues and it just seems like mental health uh, could be a part of it. What would you say to someone who's uninsured, who is desperately seeking mental health counseling and can't afford it? Is that something life you can help with? So absolutely. Actually, um, Lakeview Center is um, largely funded by state and uh, Medicaid. So we serve about 80% of the individuals, individuals we serve 
are uninsured or underinsured. Okay. Good. So we have a an evaluate, you know, a sliding fee scale. If you have the ability to pay, then we ask you to contribute, but it's not a barrier to treatment. If you don't have the ability to pay, you can get treatment. Okay. Um, and so you can call and schedule an, uh, you know, an appointment, an assessment. We go through an evaluation process to make sure we're getting you to the right level of care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously for um, urgent, we have our mobile response that you can reach out to. And then when the central receiving facility is open, then that would be available for, you know, emergency kind of um, interventions. Is there is there anything more that the county, I'm, you know, we all kind of play our part and role in the, in the community. And, and, you know, my role is one member of a five member board. Is there more, uh, in your opinion, that we could be doing to, uh, to help the, the issue, um, the mental health, to, to improve mental health outcomes for our citizens? I mean, you know, I, um, I, we do contribute. We pay a lot in Medicare, uh, Medicaid reimbursements. Our, our number is about 5 million. You know, just a few short years ago, it was 1 million. So um, there is no free. A lot of people think it's free when you go, when you go, you know, utilize the emergency room or uh, some of these clinics, they, re they, they immediately uh, seek reimbursement and we end up paying county taxpayers. A lot of people don't know that we end up paying for it. So is there more that we should be or could be doing in your opinion as county commissioners? So I, I will thank you. I'll, I'll get back to the funding question and the and the uh, miracle worker statement that you made just a little bit ago. <laughs> You're never going to forget that. <laughs> no, because I've never been called that. And I, and I, well, I you, hey, you go from a million. For making my morning. But... Well, you go from a million down to 300. I call that a miracle worker. I mean, okay, right? well, so, I mean my God. <laughs> that's one year. So I, I already warned you. We'd be having no, 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 no. We got to keep it there every year. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, this year, I would say, so I've been doing this a really long time. I've been with Lakeview almost um, 25 years. Wow. And, and the funding that we're seeing coming from Tallahassee is, um, is un, unprecedented. It's still not enough. Florida ranks 48th, 49th, I think, in the country in terms of funding for behavioral health. But we are making progress. We are making investment. And the county, you know, most of the funding that we get for behavioral health does from the state and from the federal government many times does require a local match. Sure. So the county, both San Rosa and Escambia County are investing in this central receiving facility by providing the match to the dollars that came from um, Tallahassee, uh, you know, thanks to our local delegation and Senator Broxson, you know, was a huge um, help on the Senate side, Representative Salzman on the on the House, um, but the county is contributing um, to that investment. And you challenged me, you, I, just like I'm sure you challenge everybody who comes to the county um, to make sure that we're asking all the partners who can participate to participate. Right. So part of the the funding this year was there's an opportunity to to get some federal match for the for the county contribution and so that's why the investment from the county was a little less than we initially projected because we were able to find some federal matching dollars which again that's pretty much how it works all the time in this business is that you're looking for people to contribute pieces and parts to to build the system. And so we'll continue to do that. But the investment from the county is absolutely um, making this receiving facility and this change in how we provide care making it possible. And and once the facility is up and running, do you do you feel like I, I'm, I'm kind of asking the question a different way, but do you feel like um, that will put us in a position where we're uh, let's just say on parity with other communities like uh, my understanding Tallahassee, that area has like three or four receiving facilities that 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 area that multi county area over there and and we for a while didn't i mean didn't we have to transfer our our, our juvenile baker act people all, you know all the way over to uh two counties over or something we didn't we for a time not have uh, the capacity that we're going to so, have so we've always had the adolescent capacity jeff but if if it is full then the, mm -hmm. the only other adolescent beds for inpatient hospitalization are Panama City. Panama City, okay. So we're not adding any adolescent beds. I was, I actually had the opportunity to tour the new behavioral medicine at the New Baptist campus last yes. week. It's beautiful. And they've done some things with their adolescent and child and adolescent space that I think give some flexibility that maybe they didn't have at the old campus. Um, and so, you know, there may be times we still don't have a bed and a child has to be transported. But generally with the additional community services, hopefully we'll be able to 
triage most appropriately and get people to the right level of resource. Um, and, and so that when an individual needs inpatient, it's available because the person who may have been able to be diverted to community services, you know, we've been able to do that. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Allison, thank you so much for, I mean, very, very informative, very eye-opening, interesting stuff. And I, I'm sure a lot of folks didn't realize all these resources. So if folks want to learn more about what resources are available to them, perhaps they've got a son or a daughter who uh, has issues. Is there, a, is there a website that you would point them to? Absolutely. eLakeViewCenter.org is our website for, for Lakeview Center. And if you if you just Google Lakeview Group, you'll learn a little bit more about Families First Network and Global Connections to Employment. But you can absolutely find us on the on the web. Okay. Well, I appreciate you get up early. Thank you very absolutely. much for coming Thanks on. for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And and we expect and we anticipate that uh, our, our budget commitment next year will be the same as this year for, for the uh, <laughs> 300,000. I think we can do it. Hopefully you'll be a miracle worker next year too. No, thank you, Allison. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Um, I, I've got a question here from someone that I want to answer. So I understand if you guys got to jump off, I'm going to just stay on and, and answer this question real quick. Um, or you can stay if you'd like. <laughs> Here's the question. Commissioner Bergash, you have stated you are neutral uh, toward the Perdido City uh, versus Stop Perdido. Do you think you should take a position on this since you represent the people in your district? It is apparent. The reason for this movement is because some folks voting district uh, precincts 55, 67, 73, 95, and 105 do not feel Escambia government is adequately representing them. Well, here's what I would say, Chris, on that. I am neutral on that, on the incorporation. That's a decision, as I said at the homeowners group that I attended uh, this weekend, as I've said in my town halls, that's a decision for the folks who own property and businesses in that study area. If they incorporate and if it's successful, that actually makes my job, Wes's job, Eric's job. It makes our jobs easier because the first thing we can do is give them Bower Road and Perdido Key Drive. Go get them, Tiger. Oh, but wait, they don't want the roads. So I am neutral, but I think it's important for citizens to have the facts. Now, I've gone to every We Are Perdido meeting. They've been great, great audio visual, great church, stadium seatings, you know, great sound system. Um, and I've asked a lot of questions, many of which never got answered. But I also called Lynn Tipton at the Florida League of Cities. And I got the information I needed. I understand statutorily what it takes to incorporate. I know the study area out there does not meet the density requirement. They've they've said that in their own study. So Chris, uh, I, I you know I am neutral. It would make my job easier if they did incorporate because a lot of people don't know this fact too. If they incorporate, we don't lose that revenue. A lot of people think, well, we're going to incorporate and we'll just take the county's money. No, 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 no. We still get our six point six one five mil. The sheriff will still get his MSTU. The school board will still get their um, uh, millage rate. Um, the library will still get its MSTU. The difference is any additional revenue that they need to run their new city, they would have to tack on new fees. And what are those new fees? There's only three they can use to get the money that they need in order to tap into shared revenue. That is utilities taxes, 10%. Your water, sewer, garbage, and your electric bill, 10%. New business taxes and fees and additional mills on your tax bill. They have to levy the, the equivalent of three mills on their tax roll, which is 3.6 billion, which equates to almost 11 million. They have to do that before they can tap into shared revenue. So I, I've studied this very, very carefully. And I'm telling people, look, I'm neutral I'm, and I shouldn't weigh in. I'm not going to put my thumb on the scale. If they want to incorporate, do it. If they don't want to, that's fine. That's a decision for those people, Chris. So I'm glad you asked the question. There is a meeting uh, tomorrow night at six at Bailey Middle School. It's the um, uh, it's the opposition side. So I'm going to go to that one too. I went to the We Are Perdido meeting. Now I'm going to go to the Stop Perdido meeting. Well, here's the thing though. If you want to make it a referendum on the county, the county spends a lot of money out there. Um, there's folks out there that feel we haven't spent enough. We haven't put enough local option sales tax money out there. They say we haven't put enough of our TDT revenue back. Um, that's changing. We're doing a lot of work out there and that's going to continue to change. But I will tell you this, if you're someone who doesn't really know you're on the fence, you have to ask yourself this question. What problem does incorporation solve? I'm told they're not going to take the roads. So it, it can't be the roads. Uh, I'm told they're not going to have their own police force. So it can't, I mean, they're going to use the same sheriff's office that they have. They're not going to have their own fire department. So I don't know if what problem that's solving. Uh, they are not going to have their own schools. So what problem is that solving? So you have to ask yourself, what pressing problem is incorporation going to solve? Now, I've heard different things like, well, we'll have control. Well, control over what? You don't have your own schools. You won't have your own roads. 
uh, you'll be using our codes and our zoning and our code enforcement. Um, so, I, you know, I would think carefully about it. If they were going to add a police force, I, I'd be all for it. I, I, I might even jump in and say, yeah, for additional security. I mean, or a new fire station, new fire service. Yeah, maybe. But you have to look at what problem are they solving? And anyone that says this isn't going to cost more money is not telling you the truth. The immediate first thing you're going to get is, is an increase on your utility bill. You're paying 300 now, you're going to be paying 330. That's the quickest way they're going to get revenue from the 20,000 uh, residents in that study area. So I am neutral on it, um, but I want people to get all the facts. And I think uh, I think if you get all the facts, uh, a lot of folks will, will make the right decision. If they do incorporate, again, that makes my job a lot easier. It's not going to deprive us of any revenue. Um, it, you know, and so if that's what you want to do, that's what you get to do. I hope I answered that, uh, good enough for you and very good. Hey, Allison, you didn't have to stay, but now, you know, how I feel about <laughs> incorporation, uh, Eric and Wes, we'll see you guys tomorrow at the meeting. Everyone else have a great day and we'll see you next month at our next coffee with the commissioner. Have a good one.